Hello again. These are the last two hours of our series of lectures and hopefully we'll end up with some kind of closure on the many themes we have brought up. The, um, as you might remember, we've sort of been arguing that it's not, uh, especially in countries, um, the richer countries, it's uh, probably not sensible to sacrifice uh, a lot of well-being for in the pursuit of growth, especially in the context of climate change. And that, in a sense, the political crisis in these countries is partly a result of the kind of the blind pursuit of growth without, without consideration of, you know, who are the losers, how to make them, uh, how, do, how to make them whole. So we've been arguing that for that reason, it's critical that we think, start thinking about well-being rather than growth and how to deliver well-being. And uh, in that context, uh, we, we discussed uh, the question of, you know, how, how, a government, how can governments re-establish their credibility and the, the, the kind of, and the, and the final thought there was very much that they need to do something successfully. They need to deliver well-being credibly and it's only with credible delivery that people will have some faith in governments which will then allow them to do more. We discussed uh, sort of the role of taxation, the fact that there may be, uh, there are, there may be very good reasons to tax much more uh, even without the sort of the budgetary considerations that inequality is uh, itself part of the, the, uh, the crisis and we need to address that directly. That also will, uh, but also uh, we need to raise revenue and if, and then there's a question of what do we do with the revenue. So that's sort of, so all those strands come together in this question of how would one, if one had a free hand and at least some extra revenue, how would one redesign social policy? What's, what, are, what do we know about the design of social policy? And that's the question that uh, today we'll spend the two hours on. So uh, what kind of redistribution if you want to, so specifically we have already talked about other forms of, of intervention, for example of, you know, whether we need to have policies that will help people stay in place rather than move and the opposite, how to, how to get people to move uh, rather than stay in place. So the idea of, uh, of uh, interventions that are um, targeted to specific groups is uh, very much something that also will come back to but is, is, uh, is clearly important in already what we've discussed. And now what, what, I, what I want to start by thinking about the broad principles of broad of wide wide based redistribution if you like so let me start by telling you um, a little uh, story uh, not, not so much a story as a so that's a picture of a, of a building in the middle of the city of lucknow in india it's called the bara imambara and it's a if you go there the guides will offer you many uh, very helpful and entirely false narratives about how it was, why it was built. For example, you know, they say that it, there is a tunnel under it, which, you know, uh, uh, it was an escape route for the kings and it was uh, built to fight against the British and all kinds of uh, wonderful but not actually accurate stories. And you, so it's, um, and it's a building complex, little bit odd because it doesn't really, it's, it's not a, I mean, it's not primarily an important mosque, it is not primarily an important tomb, it's just some, some set of buildings kind of put together uh, uh, in a, in a, you know, nice, around a nice garden. So it's, it's, it's a, 
Now, the truth is that it was built by the then king of, of the area around Lucknow, which is called Awadh, uh, who, who was dealing with one of the biggest famines uh, uh, that uh, India ever had. Um, it was, um, I think this period in the 1770s, lots, uh, there was a, partly as a result of transition, increasing encroachment of the British rule, about the estimates between quarter and a fifth of North Indian population died of famines. Um, the British were very uh, adamant to not help anybody. Uh, in fact, they were very explicit that they shouldn't waste their money on saving lives of people who basically deserve to die. Mm. But the king of Awadh, Awadh was, mm, Asafadullah was much more concerned and he, he spent his own money to start a, a food for work program. It, that's, it's a workfare program which was run uh, uh, during the, the period of the, uh, of the, you know, the crop failure, the drought uh, for many years. And with uh, it, the, the labor was used to build these buildings. That's, that's, these are just the results of a, of a food for work program. Now, the interesting part of that story, so that's, that all that is maybe somewhat interesting, but not, not critical. What I think is really interesting is this story, which may or may not be true, but it's either way it's interesting, which is that it's said that the, during the day, poor people came to work and they built it. And during the night, the, the elites, who were also starving, since everybody lived of agriculture, when there's a drought, everybody has, has problems. The poor couldn't pay, pay their rents, they couldn't grow, the, grow, grow, uh, grow uh, on the land. So they were um, invited to destroy parts of it during the night. So that they had something to do too. It was a food for work program. Their work was to break some parts of it, which then got fixed the next day. And so the idea, and the important part of that story was the reason why it was done that way in this narrative was that the elites would not come if it were that they had to be with the, with the rest of the population and they would be exposed to exposed to uh, the world as having, you know, uh, so fallen that they had to be working in this program. So they were invited in the night to do, um, to do, you know, other work and in the night it's easier to break than to build because you can't really see. So, so that was, that, that's the story I was told. It's a, and I think the important part of that, as I said, is it doesn't really matter whether it's true or false. What's important is that that story is a story about respecting people's dignity. It's a story about saying these elites, they will, if you don't respect their dignity, if you expose them to the world, then they won't actually take, even take the welfare. They will die rather than be exposed. And whether that's a some, maybe that's a snobbish sentiment, maybe it's a sentiment that we sh we morally disapprove, disapprove of, but it's clear that it, the recognition of that is a very important part. Of, that the fact that people have have dignity concerns when they deal with the social support system is a very important part of how we think about it. And I, so that's and I am going to be returning to that point multiple times. So I want to start by saying one thing that one thing that uh, the Mm, the, this story is emphasizing is exactly this concern with dignity. Now, interestingly, this is uh, ig dignity is now very much back in the pol policy conversations, and the key uh, sort of well, where it connects is with this idea of universal basic income. You, and uh, as you see, universal basic income is 
universal meaning it's not targeted to any specific group everybody's I mean Andrew this is a picture of Andrew Yang Andrew Yang was this candidate for the president of the US he lost in the Democrat candidate in the primaries and is now candidate for the mayor of New York City so he's his his particular view is that um, we sh universal basic income is needs to be a central piece of policy because it it is universal because it's focused on providing everyone with a basic living and because it's income and the word income is, is very important to him and to I think this conversation because it's not meant to be universal basic handout it's basic universal basic income it's some sense of something you are being paid for being a citizen before you know complying with the rules of the society participating in the activities of the society some of those activities are paid some of them are not paid this is something we discussed in the context of GDP that lots of important activities are not paid but whatever whether they're paid or not those are that those are need to be recognized as contributions and therefore it's an income that you get, get paid and I think the, all three words are important in that vision so the first point exactly about uh, UBI is that it it's built on the idea of respect that you know you everybody is as I said contributing to a, a, a positive social environment um, it, it also has quite specific one thing that's quite specific about it is that that means for one that it's not some there are no it's not a conditional transfer of some kind so a lot of transfers the there's been a massive expansion actually of some form of transfers in the world most countries now have them and this is actually a, a, a major shift in policy for a very long time the the economist view and the policymakers view was that giving people free money is a bad idea and that's we moved away from that yeah, two words I think now most countries have conditional transfers of some kind and the conditional transfers are of the form uh, usually that if you do something that's socially valuable like for example uh, you know educate your children or give get them vaccinated or get, take them to the doctor then we give you some money now one thing that this that's that's uh, I mean there are there is evidence for it so I think I think there was there is an interesting debate on exactly how much of the conditionality matters because some there are the papers which show that if you just um, signal the intent of the money people often comply with it so if you just say that you don't actually have to make it enforced so that I take away the money from you if you don't do something it can just be in there's a paper uh, Esther has a paper in Morocco suggesting that just sending the signal that this money is for education is often enough to get it spent on education so I think there's an interesting debate on how 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 stringently need to be enforced but I think relative I think their evidence also just relative to a pure un completely un uh, un narrated transfer where there, you don't say why or w w what this is for or anything like that uh, there seems to be a bigger effects on on human capital from from conditional transfers of some kind and the conditionality as I say can be enforced or unenforced it might well be um, and now the enforcement itself is costly that's the flip side of that 
enforcement is costly because in Mexico the estimate is that the enforcement part of it costs about 10 cents on the dollar and that's not even counting what the families have to do to comply. So ten, just the enforcement, checking up on the fact that the families are doing it, etc., that already costs 10 cents out of the one dollar you're going to give them. So that's quite expensive and wasteful and perhaps most importantly, it leads to the exclusion of the families that be the, may, might be the most needy because it, it's a, it leads to the exclusion of families that are uh, often unable to get their act together. The key about you know, qualifying for uh, a program like Oportunidad, what was called Oportunidades in Mexico till recently, was that you just have to, you have to uh, get, take your children to the, to the health center, you have to get them uh, get, make sure they go to school. All of those things have some, some, uh, some uh, require some organization. The families where the, you know, the parents are either, you know, let's say at war with each other or with, or have um, such a serious economic difficulty they can't focus on anything else. Those are often the families where the need is the highest but they are the least able to deliver. So you, the targeting is often bad. So I think both these points have been made. And uh, so you can, you can decide where to place yourself on that question of should the, there is advantages to the universality. You're not imposing you know, constraints on people. You're, you are reaching people who are perhaps the most needy. On the other hand, the incentive effects, the fact that you, you do invest more in human capital are lost. So, and, and I think one could go either, either way, but clearly the, if you, if you, the way a lot of the case for UBI is made is, may, is not so much based on the, that trade-off, it's just saying, you know, for out of respect for you, I'm not going to impose constraints on you. And in that sense, uh, maybe uh, the conversation or respect. The other thing that that a lot of these programs do is they constrain what you are getting. So instead of getting cash, you get kind, you get food vouchers. And I think there is a reasonable case, uh, a reasonable body of evidence suggesting that that particular intervention is bo wasteful in two ways. One is that delivering food is costly. The market does it better than the government. And the second is that the, uh, the effect on nutrition is essentially either zero or actually negative. If you give people food because of the inefficiencies in that system, people actually end up consuming less than if you gave them just money to buy it. And that's, uh, there's evidence from, from Indonesia, um, now the, and many other places. There are many, many RCTs which compare c cash and kind, almost never finding anything, any difference, except in, there are, I think, two studies that find the differences. One is in Niger and one is in the remotest parts of Mexico. And both places, what seems to be important is that these are places where the supply chains are very weak. So when the government actually brings food and delivers it, that's actually increases supply. If, if the, and that particular, so one can imagine saying that except in certain places, let's just make it cash. So, and that both, it again, respects people's autonomy, says, you know, if you want to spend it on chicken rather than on eggs, that's okay. Um, in fact, there are a bunch of, uh, there's a paper which sort of reviews the studies is a, and uh, in particular focus on the claim that, well, if you give them free money, they're just going to drink it up. The, they're going to spend it on things they don't need. Now, two things about that, even if you give them food, as long as the amount of food you're giving them is inframarginal, uh, not, they would buy more in any case, then giving them the food should not change how much you spend on, uh, it's just an income effect. You, you, all you do is you're getting them, if I was going to buy 10 kilos of rice and you give me five, 
I'll still have to buy five. So that hasn't changed. And I just all that's happened is that I don't have to spend the money that I would have spent on rice. Uh, on uh, I, I just get some extra money, so it doesn't really make a difference whether or not it's given in kind, or it shouldn't. Sometimes it might, but it and and moreover, people seem to. The evidence where it's you're just comparing people who got the money and people who didn't suggests that there isn't really, even though you're richer, you don't spend a lot of your extra money uh, on alcohol or cigarettes or other other uh, bads. So I, I think that there's a nice review article suggesting that this idea that you should worry about you should give people food because otherwise they spend it on bad things. In some sense, it seems to be false on both the theoretical premise and the empirical evidence. So, in that sense, maybe if you really think that giving people autonomy is important, treating it as income is important, then then it's uh, then the case for UBI. The, perhaps one of the strong strong planks for the UBI is precisely that, which is that people are, it, it, it gives people or respects people's autonomy. Now I'm going to, I'll take a break for a second and see if there are any questions, but then otherwise we continue this. Not yet. Okay. Now, the other, I think, major uh, advantage of UBI is it's universal. That's in some sense also it's disadvantage. I come back to that, but it means that it does, you don't need to target. Now targeting is actually a huge enterprise. Uh, for example, where we worked on it, which is in Indonesia, what the government does is it every few years it it collects very detailed data from about two hundred thousand people and tries to figure out a model of how to predict who is poor and then uses that model meaning what it does is says look if you have a nice home and a car you're probably not poor so it tries to connect your state of poverty to a few few things that you own then based on that ownership list it makes up a it collects data then every, before the money is given out it goes out and collects data on all that that list of things so if it says that cars and houses and televisions are the markers of being wealthy, then it collects data on cars and televisions and, and uh, houses. And once it's collected that data, it says, you know, you have this house, so you don't, you're not going to get it. If, you, if somebody else doesn't have that house, they get it. Turns out in both directions, it's extremely porous so, and then just the quality of the data isn't wonderful and people's status changes. They don't sell their house the day they lose their job. So if you combine those things, you can often have 50% targeting errors. Enormous, you know, people just, you get the, all the wrong people in, just even with the best of intent. And then there's the questions of best, of, where this is often in the data collection process, maybe I have a friend who's collecting the data or who knows who's collecting the data and my data gets fudged a little. There's all kinds of issues. So this, um, so plus, uh, and just that sort of just the even, the, even with the best of intentions, you it's very hard to do this job. Plus, I think people often, um, often uh, don't even try. So I'll, I'll, I'll give you, so in Delhi, one third of the eligible women actually get the pension they're eligible for. In Indonesia, here's a, here's a number that's, this was uh, a program which gave, if you sign, if you got accepted into this program, it's called Pekaha, you would get six, about and up to 13% of your annual income for six years. And that depended a bit on whether how many children you had, so it could be 13%, could be less, but quite a lot of money. That's quite a lot of money. Uh, none the, and what's plotted on, in the graphic that's on, your, on the right is the application rate as a function of your 
your income, just a measure of income. And 13 is eligibility. So think of 11.5 as being way below el eligibility, basically a third of the earnings, something like a third of the earnings of people who are, who are, um, who, who are, you know, the, there's a critical cutoff, you're earning th one third of that or something like that. So when you're 11 and you are still, or 11 and a half, and you're still uh, not applying. So 60% of the people who are at 11 and a half apply. Or at 12, it's more precisely estimated. And you can see that again, it's 60% or 55%. 55% of the, of the poorest people apply. So it's not, in other words, even though this is a, is a very generous program, and if you are that poor, you're surely eligible uh, according to uh, the rules and this is uh, this is our attempt to measure consumption um, this is uh, so it's reasonably good data so I, do, I think it's mostly just people don't apply why don't they apply well they don't know about it one one key thing is mm, you know the, in, in this I told you in Delhi uh, women who were eligible for pensions from the government didn't didn't get it, most of them didn't get it. Well, a lot of them actually uh, didn't know that it existed. They didn't know that it was for them. So when you went and told them, then they started applying. Now, there was also a lot of women thought that there's no point applying because you, know, you don't get money from the government free, you'll have to pay a bribe to somebody and it's not going to be worth it. Now, it turns out that this was from a randomized experiment that uh, was done with the World Bank. It turns out you didn't have to pick up bribe. If you applied, you got the money. But they didn't apply because they had theory. This is, goes back to this question and trust in government. If you, if you, if theory was that, you know, of course you'll have to pay a bribe. So let's not bother. But that, that, that particular structure, of course, created uh, more exclusion. And then the application process, so as I said, if you give them information, they try to apply, but they usually fail. The application process was too complicated. You have to demonstrate that these were, for example, if you were a widow, you had to find your husband's death certificate, which happens to be something that, you know, you have to actually, if you haven't preserved it, it might, you have to go apply and then you have to get it from, it was too much of a pain, they didn't know how to do it. Um, they, so, what the, one of the arms of this experiment was to just go help them. Uh, they sent somebody to their homes and helped them, uh, brought them the papers and helped them look for it and if they didn't have something, help them get it and then of course, a lot more people got it. Now, even with maximal help, only 26% of the eligible women who had not yet got it. So one third people already had it, two thirds, so this is out of that two third that remains, 26% of them finally ended up getting it. So that's a, you know, a, a, another, maybe another 17, 18% of the population. So it goes from one third to, to 50%, but that's it. You, you, you still don't have 50% of the eligible people didn't get it. <clears throat> and I think that, uh, you know, the, this, is, this is partly because the processes are often unnecessarily complicated. There is this obsession with verifying and making sure that no ineligible people benefit. We in fact know that lots of them do because the process itself is so, so hard to implement that in fact the errors on both sides, lots of people get it who shouldn't get it. Nonetheless, and not, not, not just because there's corruption, just even because you know you can't measure both things and things are very hard to, hard to check and, and so people make errors on both sides. But then the reaction to that, because we are so obsessed in, in allowing, not allowing anyone in, is, is often that we, uh, we end up sort of excluding people who should be included because we want to set up processes which are 
completely foolproof. And of course, that's an entirely an illusion, but it's very much. So we, we, been, we had an extended fight. We, we, we were doing, trying to do similar work in the south of India, and the government officials, so we would produce lists of women who were eligible for pensions but were not getting it. And we were, we were, we would then go to the government, uh, the kind of the heads of the bureaucracy, and they say, "Yes, this is great." And then the people who were actually there to implement it would block those. They would say, "No, this person doesn't look completely eligible. Maybe there is something we need to check." So it would just be like we, it was. It was a, a comp and this was not because they were asking for a bribe since they were refusing if you if you want to ask for a bribe you would just say yes and then go uh, bully them they said no uh, we don't want to add these people at all so they were not there were no interest in 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 uh, making money from it they were just in principle they thought that our job is to screen out people so the whole structure is a bit built on this this goes back to this question of universal basic income obviously which is where, where when you don't have that uh, and uh, th this is the point I'm making, Th the rejection rates are very high, partly because the, the inclination of the organization is to reject, uh, partly because uh, the, there is, you know, the, the mechanism of checking for eligibility are very poor, the data you need for it are often hard to get, and when you don't have the data, you say, okay, I'll do it later, but don't do it. So as a result, if you take the, this is the same program in Indonesia, and this is now saying who got it, finally. And if you take the people who are at 12, these are different, they're, they're different lines because these are different districts, and some districts it's higher, it can be as high as 35%, it can be as low as 10%, so 12%, uh, so it's, it's really, extraordinarily, you, the maximum is like 35%. You can no, never get, these are people who are at 12, which means they're about at half of the cutoff. So the cutoff is 100, they're at 50. And those people, even among them, the eligibility, the final uh, uh, success in getting the program after all these steps, as I said before, Many, only 60% apply, but after those 60%, still half of them are rejected, more than half of them are rejected for various reasons. And so essentially, very few people end up getting the program. And then of course, that discourages people from applying. People don't apply because they know the story that, you know, X applied and didn't get it. Okay, I'll stop there and see if there are any questions. Uh, there's one question which goes back to the cash transfer. So the person is asking that uh, one classic objection to this kind of transfer used to be inflation. And is there evidence to help disprove this? Uh, I, I don't know that, that, that I think unless the concern is with, with uh, very local supply chains, which is the concern I mentioned before, which is that maybe the supply chains don't work very well. And so, you know, the market doesn't move grain from that village to this village. Otherwise, it's this, these are supposed to be budget neutral. You raise taxes or you change other programs and you replace them by this. So the, the question here is not of expanding government expenditure, which may also be justifiable, but it's, this is an entirely separate question, which is, uh, is it the case that if I have a budget neutral shift, so there's no extra money being spent on total. Now, that doesn't mean that, you know, maybe there's more money being spent in village A where the poor live and less money being spent in village B where the rich live, and that's, that could have consequences, you know, when, when you move income from the rich to the poor, since the poor consume more rice, or whatever, some grains and they pr consume less cars, you're going to get the demand for cars will go down, the demand for food will go up, and so on net that might have an effect. But it depends on how good the supply chains are. If the supply chains are decent, that's, the, that's why the empirical results are useful. You look at the effects of giving people cash transfers versus food transfers and you see essentially no difference. So 
you, it doesn't make a difference whether the government is in charge of the supply chain or whether, whether the, the market does the supply chain. That, that's for now, that's it. Okay, I'll continue. <coughs> Another uh, reason why people don't take the program, especially in a country like the US, is stigma. People really hate the idea uh, of being classified with the, with, the, uh, with the poor. And the reason partly is that of, I think, especially starting in the 1980s, uh, there's so much stigmatization of being poor. There was this whole ideology of, and the US has always had this, which is, uh, this ideology of, of, you know, if I only tried hard enough, I could always succeed and uh, become a millionaire. That kind of ideology has always been very important in a country like the U.S. But, uh, but also um, that was, I think, a, a, pretty, a kind of insidiously racist dimension was added to that. That you know, we discussed this last time. Black people are more likely to get welfare, so. If you are going try, applying for welfare and you're not black, are you just giving up your racial identity? So there was a lot of priming on that. Politicians clearly played with that association, and so there was a. I think it was a. It, so as a result, um, the pro, a lot of the um, lot of these uh, welfare programs have poor take up. Um, in particular, uh, the program, uh, so the, the program for providing food in um, food subsidies is uh, in the U.S. is called food stamps. And once upon a time, 40 years ago, it used to be stamps. So you got a lot of stamps which you would pay instead of money. And the vision people have is that you go to, you are standing in line. And instead of paying with money or with a credit card like everyone else, you're paying with these little stamps. And that marks you out to be somebody who is really extremely, uh, extremely needy. In fact, that has been changed a long time ago. Most these, these cards that you see in that picture are all uh, kinds of cards that are given to, the credit cards basically given to people who are beneficiaries. So, but the word food stamp is often used. So, and it's an, it's an experiment where if you used the word food stamp, then many less people want to apply. Then if you said, we're going to give you a card that will help you with this help that's for working families to increase their nutrition and improve the nutrition, that's then more people apply. So it's very much this question of stigma. Um, yeah, that's, a, that's what I was saying, and uh, these are the snap cards. Um, so the UBI, I think, is designed to counteract this. It's anybody can get it, so it's not. It's it's, an, it's a transfer to your bank account. So at some level, you don't have to. Then you what you do with it? You bring cash. You pay. You pay with a credit card. That's your choice. And I think the rhetoric around it also is different. It's meant to be not, you know, uh, help to needy to the needy, but an income, as I said. And so in and in. Uh, for example, Andrew Yang calls it freedom dividend, and that that's very much a way to change the rhetoric around it. I mean, that that, that won't make it perfect. There will still be people who will not know that it's universal, who will still worry that it's the stigma, or they will still not apply for it. But I think one could do a lot to fix that. I think. So that's the, that's the that's a, another very important part of the case for UBI. A third third uh, I think important part of the case for UBI is uh, the idea that 
um, because these are, uh, this is a stable source of future income, which is not, it's, uh, you know, you, you have, um, you are guaranteed this and it, it's uh, meant to be, so if you, you won't go away if you got to get, get a little richer or if you, if you stop, if you know, you fail to send your children to school. So that it, there is maybe a sense in which it has less risk. It's, it's sort of a, it's a very, and because it mitigates risk and because it provides you with a stable source of income, it might encourage investment. It might actually get you to, you know, you may, you may not want to use your kind of, you know, especially if, if, if the, if it's seen as being, uh, let's say, you know, you, if, if, if the money you get is seen as being, you know, uh, right now you're getting it is a special program for which you qualify for, but soon you may not qualify for it. It's, that's very different from saying you, you now for the rest of your life, you're going to get a thousand dollars a month. And if you get a thousand dollars a month, you could spend it for, you could spend it for whatever you want. You may be much more prepared to borrow to, uh, against that money to start a business or take a risk and say, if I, even if I fail, I have my thousand dollars a month. So it might change your investment. And there's some evidence from, from Indonesia that, you know, th there's in more investment in children. There's some evidence from Kenya that in work we are doing on UBI. Uh, our, this is a 12-year UBI, so we, we will not have full results right now. But what we see is after two years, uh, the beneficiaries are much more likely to have started a business. So it, it, there is some effect of having. Now, the Kenya one is a little bit not the same thing because actually even the Indonesia one is because it's not budget neutral, it's extra money. So extra money obviously has that effort. And in some ways, if you listen to Andrew Yang, he's also not saying it'll be budget neutral. We'll come back to the question of budget neutrality. He's saying we'll use extra resources to do it. So it's not, not just a question of a budget neutral transfer. It's saying if we gave people a bit more cash in hand, would they change behavior? Which is a somewhat different question. It's not just that I take money away from your, you, you were, the way, for example, Finland, which has done an experiment on, on UBI, did it is it said, you can either have uh, a cash payment or you can have these different subsidies, housing subsidy a little bit, little bit subsidy for food, little bit subsidy for healthcare, etc. I take all of them away and I give you one chunk of money. And that's, uh, that's more budget neutral. Uh, what these experiments are focusing on, and that's sort of what Andrew Yang is also talking about, is extra money. Some, some amount of his extra money is not replacement. And I think that's, that's important point to make. And they might have different investment effects. Even though you might imagine just the fact that now I'm not getting a small amount for housing, a small amount for children, a small amount for food, etc., might also make it easier for me to invest. It's a, it's a single amount of cash I might make able to invest it, whereas some of it is tied to housing, some of it is tied to food, etc. I may not be have the same flexibility in spending it. Um, okay, is there a uh, is there a question? Um, there are two questions. The first one, the person is asking, um, like, have transparency measures intended for anti-corruption actually ended up strengthening the kind of blind rule adherence that you talked about previously among Indian bureaucrats, this uh, like exclu exclusionary behavior or not? And the, and the, and the other question is that uh, the person is asking, does the weight of the informal sector in developing countries uh, prevents us from answering precisely the question on who is, like the poor people are? Sorry, yeah. precisely the question? 
like uh, how can we identify the poor people? Good. So both yeah. questions are great. Both questions I, I, I agree with. I think transparency and the general value of put on on getting you know, inclusion right, you could be transparent and say, look, we make mistakes. That mistakes are okay. Somehow the the uh, the ideology of the government. So the government seems to take a stance that you know there's lots and lots. We know that the government is uh, often making mistakes, but somehow its is ideological stance is we we are always getting it right. And I think that focus on always getting it right is is a part of this uh, the, of the problem that you know we 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 don't. We don't have create a space within which the government can say yes, you know, and shit happens, and uh, you know things go wrong. But that's that's okay. That's uh, that that's life. It's uh, we we will we're trying our best, and it's better to make the errors of inclusion than errors of exclusion, especially. Uh, so I, I think that would I think that's that's that particular rhetoric of government needs to be more there. The governments tend to want to claim they're getting everything right. And I think that's, that's an important, important part of uh, how governments need to change. Um, on, the, on, on the second question, um, what was it, remind me? Yeah, yeah, so the informal sector makes it much harder to target because we don't know people's income. And that's why, in a sense, the Indonesians use this, uh, this uh, noisy, Markers, which are you know, do you have a car? Do you have a bicycle? Do you have a television? Do you have a, you know, a house with more than two, two rooms? Do you have a, a roof that's made out of bricks rather than out of uh, tin? Uh, so th th those are the kinds of things that, or is it thatched roof or tin roof? You know, those are the kinds of things that uh, people seem to use, and the, and of course those things are not very good predictors uh, you know you might have a business but your business might have failed completely and i might not have a business but uh, you know i i might make a lot of money uh, you know whatever uh, um, working for someone else and but you know maybe you 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 have more assets because you originally your business was doing well and you're still so you may i think it makes it very hard to, to identify, so that's an excellent point. Okay, uh, so I put this up. Uh, so this is, a, I, I'm a tenured professor, um, and you know, this, whenever this conversation about incentives happen, I think of myself. Uh, I think I'm almost impossible to fire me, uh, but I, I, I work, uh, probably more than I uh, used to when I was younger and it's just so I think the idea that so I think the at, at the core of the economic um, one of the economic arguments for UBI is this idea that labor supply is you know one reason to have UBI is that there isn't there is a there is the labor supply, there's no labor supply response. And let me explain that idea, or the labor supply response is more favorable. So the idea is, you know, incentives are critical for making people work. That's why tenured professors are, uh, like the professor in that picture, is, are mostly asleep, uh, people like me. Uh, we, we, we don't work because we don't have any incentives. Now that, that uh, so that's part of the narrative of, uh, of uh, the, the traditional critique of welfare is, comes in two parts. One is there's an incentive effect, which is that if you, if you give people welfare and it's targeted, that means as you get, if you work hard and you make more money, then you lose your welfare. So that basically means that even as I get richer, my welfare goes away, so my net gains from working hard are small. So that's, that's point number one. Point number two is there's an income effect. So there's an incentive effect and there's an income effect. What's the income effect? I'm richer, so I should just, you know, I, I prefer to be, take part of my extra income as, as leisure, so I should work less and take, take more 
more leisure out of uh, out of life. So uh, I should go on vacation more. So I, I so UBI has just an income effect. It does make people potentially richer, especially if it's not replacing other programs. But it it is it's uh, it's not. Um, but it doesn't have this, since it's universal, since you never lose it, even if you get richer, there is no incentive effect. So that's one argument that's often made in favor of UBI. Now, this is Ronald Reagan, for those of you who are so young that you haven't uh, seen a picture of him. He was famously um, against welfare and his case for against welfare was that it makes people lazy and that this is the reason why the poor are are suffering and that you know if you just took them away they would work harder so for example um, based on very much this theory the recent cares act in the u.s which provided people with welfare uh, you know with unemployment insurance that was very generous. Sometimes by becoming unemployed, they would earn more money than keeping their jobs. And this has been studied, so that's a massive incentive effect. As this has been studied extensively, and in that particular case, people find no evidence of an, of an incentive effect. Now you might say that that's a little cheating because that was a temporary uh, you don't want to quit a job for a two-month welfare payment. You don't know how long a welfare payment will last. So maybe that's natural. Um, here's a more, um, maybe a, another example um, from Switzerland. Between 1999 and 2001, Switzerland changed the basis of taxation, of the, the income that was taxed, the definition of that changed. And I don't want to explain exactly what they did because it's not that useful. The result uh, of trying to change that was that they said, look, for the, for the two years between when the previous regime ends and the new regime starts, you pay no taxes. And different cantons in, in Switzerland changed in different years. So some changed in, in 2000 and then 99 and 2000 were the two years where it, they didn't pay any taxes. Some changed into in 1999 and then for 90, uh, I think the two years before actually I got it wrong, 97 and 98 you paid no taxes. And if you change 2001, it's for 99 and 2000 you paid no taxes. So taxes were uh, fully, you have paid no income taxes for two years and that varied by canton. The incentive theory says people should really work much harder those, during those years because that's their chance to make a lot of money. And Switzerland is high taxes, so it's not, this, this is not a trivial amount of money. Uh, the study finds no effect on labor supply. So what, why am I saying all this? To remind you, the claim is that one advantage of UBI is that it, it has a big uh, incentive advantage. There's no incentive effect to UBI. You don't lose the money by working hard. Um, so since we're talking about UBI, maybe, um, you know, after the, the, as I said, the CARES Act evidence is a bit mixed because you don't know exactly how much the temporariness mattered. And then if you tell you, give people example of Switzerland, they say that's Switzerland, that they're weird. Uh, and then, I mean, that, therefore, then you can look at, this is uh, in the US, they really like evidence from the US. Um, and so in the US, uh, this is evidence from one of the first, uh, uh, you know, l literally perhaps the first social science randomized control trial. This was done in the late 60s and early 70s. It's called the negative income tax experiments. And th what this experiment did there was actually, I think, 11 different sites which did this experiment in different ways, slightly different ways. In all of them, the idea was, what's a negative income tax? Well, imagine a setting where we guarantee everybody, um, everybody uh, a, a, a fixed um, income, 
and then as their income goes up they pay more taxes so so basically when they're very poor the net taxes they pay is negative because they they you know they they get a guaranteed lump sum payment and then all they pay taxes but taxes on uh, are very little when they're very poor and so they're getting they're getting actually money from the government as they get richer they pay more in taxes at some point the taxes are exactly equal to the lump sum they're getting and then they start paying if they're richer than that they pay positive taxes so that's the negative income tax so in this experiment uh, one thing they did was this was there was a bunch of our cities around that and it offered uh, different types of subs and these they were varied these subsidies a little bit based on the type of the worker etc so there was there was a, a many wrinkles that i'm not that interested in the question was this is a this this is a program which has an incentive effect because as you get richer you pay more ta more in taxes shows so the net amount the government pays you goes becomes smaller and smaller so it's it has an incentive effect and the idea was to use it to estimated income uh, effect they find that a 10% increase in wages per hour so or 10% reduction in taxes if you like increased labor supply by 1% so there is some negative uh, reduced labor supply by 1% so there was some incentive effect but it was small and it's uh, very uh, and it was bigger for married women who typically were often would stop working to take care of the children when they got this so that was still not huge but uh, now over time people have redone this and they now the claim is that the effect on the secondary earner the married women is much smaller partly because women are much more attached to the labor market now so this effect is now more the women are now much more like their partners so they are much more the elasticity is also small so the net result of all of this is to say that you know yes there is a disincentive effect it's not surprising some of the people who are doing the some of the jobs people are doing are awful they're sort of cleaning garbage in at the six in the morning or something and so it's not implausible that some of those people decide that they just don't want that job they look for a better job they'll quit and do spend more time looking for a job so i'm not surprised that there's an effect but the effect is small and it's mostly at the extensive margin people don't change hours they change um, whether they're working or not and that's that 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 suggests again that yes there is a small advantage there for ubi but it's probably the less compelling reason for it apropos this discussion we had uh, it's it's pro it's also worth saying that on the other hand i said the in incentive effect is at best at worst small and so that's probably not the strongest argument the income effect is the other one ubi has an income effect as long as it's net income if it's not replacing other transfers and i think the evidence of the income effect is uh, is very um, reassuring if you look at these are from seven randomized control trials which we put together and you can see that essentially if you take the people who got the uh, the transfer versus people who didn't there was absolutely no effect on labor supply of any measure of labor supply I, it could have gone up a little down a little but nothing significant there's no significant difference in hours worked or whether you were working or not uh, that's uh, now it's probably the case that some people uh, stopped working uh, in particular women uh, who have young children and who are paying for child care might decide that that's now they're going to do the child care themselves they get better 
maybe the satisfaction from that. So, I can imagine specific groups reducing labor supply, but other groups compensated by increasing labor supply, basically getting income. Uh, we discussed this before a uh, little while ago that you know transfers allow you to make take loans, make investments, take risks. So, you might actually start something and it seems like one of the reasons why uh, we, people invest more is that they actually have an asset which may demands work. So, they might have they might buy some goats and the goats will then need to be fed and taken out and taken care of and that takes more time. So, they end up working harder. There is also some evidence from our work in Ghana suggesting that getting an income transfer uh, when you are very poor actually makes you feel more positive and that is why you work harder. Uh, a lot of poor people one thing that we are increasingly uh, I think uh, in, in getting aware of is how much uh, mental health issues there are among the poor and I think one of the advantages of, of getting some of the pressure off you is that you may feel, feel less bad about your life and therefore, you might actually work harder. So, I think that there is some reasonable argument to be made of that kind. So, it is uh, some psychological benefits as well. Now, The, the, what is the case against UBI? That is sort of the case for UBI. It seems to, it provides dignity, it, it's, it, it avoids targeting, it, it does not seem you know uh, there is small advantage in terms of, of incentive effects and maybe a bigger advantage in terms of income effects. What I think is more, more less uh, clearly articulated is what is the downside. Well, one downside is just $1000 per adult Andrew Yang's plan would cost 12, 13 percent of US GDP um, and how much would that come from cuts in existing government programs uh, and if so, what is the net net generosity and I think that is a that is a that is clearly a question is there really going to be is it affordable that is a question that I am less uh, so, I think there, there, there is a real concern. On the other hand, um, as we discussed the US also needs to raise more revenue. So, it will be a combination of replacement and more revenue. Um, I think what, what I would say is one of the strong arguments against it is that it, it is or at least against rely only on UBI is that it does not have the, precisely because it eschews targeting it means that you cannot use it to, to deal with what we highlighted which is the fact that the losers are very concentrated. They lose a lot and they are all living in the same place. And so, uh, and then they, as a result, they lose more because they are all living in the same place. So, incomes go down, shops close, amenities uh, go away. So, their quality of life goes down as well. So, it's uh, so in some sense, it's not the the case we made for a, for a, a more targeted transfer was precisely that uh, th that you know there are people who are just have massive shocks to, to them uh, which are not compensated by any other scheme and the UBI precisely because anything that it gives them we will have to give everyone else is not ideal for that. In some ways you want to discriminate, you want to say that these guys they are paying for our well being. We are we are buying cheaper electronics from China and for that reason a lot of people are losing their jobs in North Carolina and those people deserve compensation. So, it is it, it, at least I think that is a that is an important and while I think reducing stigma is important maybe there are easier ways to do it. You do not necessarily have to go there you might also change the whole conversation about unemployment. Is it is your fault or not? The question of fault seems to me to be unnecessary. I, I think perhaps the most important uh, concern with UBI is, is it does not uh, deal with the 
the uh, qu qu challenge of loss of meaning. So a lot of Americans, about half of Americans say that they get meaning in life from their job. And suddenly the way they behave after they lose their job is very much reflective of that. I think uh, Esther already talked a little bit about that, which is this issue of what do you do with your, once you lose your job, with your time. And the, the, the sad fact is that most people don't find a way to use that time productively. It's not that they are spending that time, you know, doing social work, even if their incomes are covered, they are often in a, they are depressed, they are watching TV, they are drinking, they are they're doing things that are not very good for their health. And that's a, that seems to be a consequence of the losing their sense of what, how they are supposed to live their life. Um, and uh, that's related to the deaths of despair we talked about as well. And this is, if this is what we are really worried about, it's certainly the Silicon Valley billionaires who are very much the supporters of UBI are certainly worried about that. They're, they know that they might be blamed for the next crisis when tons of people lose their job because AI is so efficient and that AI genie has been now let out of the bottle and it's just going where it wants to go and we don't know how much but the estimates that we see uh, there is a uh, Daruna Simoglu and and uh, what's Pasquale's last name um, they have a paper showing that in industry, in areas which where the industries that are more subject to current changes in AI, uh, the losses in jobs are higher. So, so net net losses. So jobs are not being replaced. So the, I think that there is a real reason to worry about it. But if what's happening is that a lot of people in the sort of in middle skilled jobs are going to be basically you know people who are now reasonably skilled who, whose jobs are, are satisfying and interesting jobs for them are all now basically put out to pasture because there's n the, the machines can do the job better then telling them that your income is secure may not be enough they might just be too 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 depressed to deal with their lives so the question is how do I, how do we Th think about the question of meaning in the context of UBI. So I'm going to come back to this question in a minute, but before that, just to summarize, I would say that our the position we take in the book is that in poor countries, both because of you know what I think one of the questioners asked, which is that the dominance of the informal sector makes targeting extremely difficult. Given that. I would say going for what we call an ultra uh, universal ultra basic income, so UUBI, something that's very very minimal but will allow you to survive and will uh, and is then not targeted or at least not or at least if targeted targeted only by geography or only by only by some very mild form of self targeting like for example you have to every week go and, and sign in uh, to, to get it. So some, something that's not a lot of uh, cost might actually be the right solution. In, in richer countries, I think the targeting is less of a problem. People are pay income taxes, they're in the tax system, their earnings are known. So you, it's much easier to target them. Um, Basically, something like the food stamps, the SNAP program, etc. These are like UUBI. So, what we really want is a program that takes the next step of compensating losers effectively, and th that might be much more targeted to losers. We know who the losers are usually, and I think that the real challenge is designing programs which pro protect the dignity and the meaning of life of the recipient. So how do we do that? That's, that, that's the next uh, question that I'm going to turn to. Uh, but uh, rather, that's not, I spoke wrong. I'm going to, 
I would like, to, I'll come back to that question. That's the last thing I'm going to talk about on this, on this issue. That's the next question we'll come to. Before that, I want to raise an issue which I think is clearly, obviously on, on many of your minds, which is, can, suppose we assume that uh, the, we know what to do. Can we do it? Is it possible to do it? And in particular, is it the case that we can, there, there is enough, how to generate enough political support for redistribution and why, why isn't there political support for redistribution? So is it, is it the case that at some level, the only way to make this happen would be to increase taxes and uh, redistribute? And as I mentioned last time, we know that in, actually in, both in, in the US and in France and in the UK, uh, the vote for the pro-redistribution parties has been becoming more concentrated among the richer people. Poorer people are turning on, on redistribution. Um, and the, so question is, uh, is it possible to put together a more effective coalition for redistribution and what stops it. So I'm not going to be able to say very much about how to put together a coalition, but I think it's di the diagnosis of the problem is interesting and, and worth thinking about. So the first point I want to make here is that the, the The, I mean, there's no, the, in the US in particular, the ultra rich have always, with some exceptions now, I would say, but till recently, the ultra rich were very much against redistribution. And so there's a lot of money power. That's always, and suddenly, you know, if you think of mm, people like, Peter Thiel, who set up PayPal, her, these are very ideological uh, billionaires who put their money, or uh, or Charles Koch. Uh, the, these these are people who put their money very much behind uh, the idea that you know, liber libertarian positions are the only justifiable ones, and taxes should always be low because they have made the money by working hard and why, how do, dare you take it away? So there, but I think the interesting question is, do, do you, do you uh, see, um, do you see, um, what, what, do you see support for redistribution among people who are not so rich? And the, and I, I want to start by giving the, the good news. The good news is that what this graphic does is it plots um, the Republican lean in the closest presidential election, meaning how much pro-Republican this was. And more Republican areas, so areas where people vote for the general Republican view that uh, you should, you know, low taxes are the, are the, you know, panacea for everything, uh, are, you know, t t tend to be quite supportive of minimum wage ballots. So they, they are not against redistribution, they just don't want government to be involved in the redistribution. Minimum wages are in a sense a way to redistribute from the private sector to the to the private sector, so some take it money from business owners to give it to the workers, and they are quite supportive of that. So it's not the case that the average Republican voter, who, as we know, is increasingly poorer, he's not necessarily against redistribution. He's just against redistribution that goes through the government. So I think that's important in understanding. That's what I'm saying. What we were trying to do is get the diagnosis of the problem. The diagnosis is that the, prob the problem is redistribution that the government is doing. Um, this is more, uh, 
you know, I think the tax the rich ballots are the ones that, uh, again, it's not, it's Democrat areas as well, the tax the rich ballots tend to be in that bottom. You can see where they are, they, they tend to lose. So again, even in among Democrats, uh, so this is on the bottom left uh, rectangle, you see that there, uh, that's where, uh, these are mostly Democrat leaning states where they have tax the rich ballots which lose mostly. So it's, it's again, even among Democrats, the idea of government uh, being involved in the, <coughs> in the redistributive process is very limited. And that's the, the starting point. More generally, this is um, on a one to seven scale, should government reduce income differences? Should government help the poor? And in both cases, I think the key, as I said, what I'm emphasizing is government. There's government in those, both of those words. Uh, I to, as I was telling you last time, trust in government is falling. This may not be unrelated to that, but you see that what's happening is that the support for, for uh, both of these propositions is going down and is going down uh, you know, re 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 reasonably, uh, reasonably um, kind of uh, monotonically over the, over the la last 20, uh, 30 years. So people are less and less willing to say that government should help the poor. Uh, this is mostly happening because of the elderly. And it doesn't go away if you control for economic differences. So you can control for economic differences between the elderly and the others. So the el elderly are, the, you, can, you can say maybe the elderly are richer and therefore they're more ag against the poor, but you, you don't actually, so the, uh, the, the downward sloping curve the, is, is picking up the pattern among the the squares and the the flat curve is picking up um, uh, among the um, among the rounds. Okay, so now this is this is a um, um, I. A small digression, but one that I think is wonderful. Um, this is from um, uh, a play by George Bernard Shaw, who was a, who was a very famous mid 20th century playwright, uh, uh, Irish uh, a socialist uh, playwright who, who, wrote, who whose most famous play is called Pygmalion. This is from Pygmalion. Pygmalion was made into a movie called My Fair Lady, which um, I, is a musical, um, quite famous musical from the 1960s, which I really like. Um, and this is, this is a character in, in the book. And he, again, I think the question is, so as I said, the, re, the old, older people are particularly have become more and more anti anti poor and that my, and that's not because they are richer it's because of controlling for wealth doesn't do anything to that so it's because they are more uh, more um, uh, they have some moral concern presumably with with either the government intervening or just helping the poor and the, 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 there's a long tradition, Christian tradition in particular, of, of being against the idea of sloth. And that sloth is, uh, you know, is punishable by hellfires. So you, you don't do things that you can do. And um, this is, um, so this is very much the subtext of a lot of these conversations, which 
it's not unrelated to the fact that the others very strong basis of the support for the republicans are evangelical christianity so again that's not that's not accidental those that correlation is is uh, in the us is not accidental so so this is a particularly um, so this is a kind of pushing back against that ideology and it's basically says look i I ask you, what am I? I'm one of the undeserving poor. So this is very much pushing back against the idea that if the poor, you know, need to be helped, they need to be deserving. And that's, that came with the idea that, you know, certain people who are, maybe they don't, can't work, don't work, but everybody else who's not working is undeserving and therefore a whole ideology, a policy was built on that. The Victorian poor houses famously were built on exactly that idea that and where men and families were separated, men were, uh, were you know, there was a, had to, there would be large rooms with bunks next to each other, only men were slept there, their wives would sleep in a different room. There were, there were all kinds of ways in which it was made to be as humiliating as possible. And that's, so this is all, this is actually the place set in Victorian times, or Edwardian times, post-Victorian, but early 20th century. And the, and as he's saying, you know, I, I like, I like to eat more than uh, most deserving poor people, and I like to drink a, a lot more. And so, I, I, the fact that the focus on deserving poor is, is uh, makes it even harder for me, and I in particular need the money because I am actually the kind of person who really likes to drink and likes to uh, uh, likes to be ch cheerful, and I want to enjoy life. And so, this whole ideology of of being anti-poor uh, in this uh, because they are supposed to be like you know lazy is what what this uh, this uh, this character in the play is pushing back against. I think that's combined with a, a real concern about something that we already talked about, which is the incentive effect. So I think people really think that this if we make welfare generous then people will become so lazy that they would actually hurt themselves. So, and if you ask people, what do you expect if, for example, there's universal basic income of, of basically $1,000 a month, like Andrew Young is, is uh, proposing, what, what would, how many people will stop working? Well, half the people will stop working, is the prediction people are making, and this is a poll we did. Uh, and, but if you ask them, will you stop working? And then the answer is no, I won't stop working, but everyone else will. So there is a general pessimism about how people will react. The income elasticity of, of uh, labor supply is massive. So a negative income, it, it, you know, you're going to stop working as soon as you get free money. And it's just the, the threat of hunger that keeps people working in this theory. So that, that's a, uh, now, along with that, I think the other reason, so I think there's a moral dimension, a kind of a maybe Christian moral dimension to that, but I think there is this incentive effect, which I think is over exaggerated, massively exaggerated income, income effect, which people believe in. The other thing people believe in is that if you try in America, you can always make it. And uh, the perceived uh, social mobility in the in in the U.S. Uh, is um, you see if you look at perceived in U.S. Uh, mobility, uh, the U.S. tends to have a probability of remaining in the bottom quintile of earnings. Uh, if if your children, the U.S. thinks roughly that the, you know your if you. Start in the bottom quintile, you stay in the bottom quintile with the probability of about a third. If, if you compare that, let's say, with France, in France, um, the, the ac actual uh, social mobility is uh, is uh, some, some 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 something like. Uh, 
30 um, percent will remain, but people actually perceive that much more will remain. People, France is much more mobile than people perceive. Uh, so is the UK. Most countries uh, in the OECD, people are actually much more pessimistic than the truth. The perception is that everybody will stay where they are. In fact, there's more mobility in France uh, than in the US, but people think that the US is much more mobile than France. So it's, it's uh, it, Americans believe in the American, what is called the American dream, the dream that anybody can become ultra rich, which in a sense is an illusion. Because America is actually, in, if you look in this graphic, America is actually the least mobile country in that graphic. On the left panel, uh, Sweden, um, Italy, France, uh, all of them are more mobile than America. But in fact, uh, America is, uh, is the one where people actually believe they're the most mobile. So that, that also contributes exactly to this, which is that if I believe it's easy to move, then why, why should I use welfare? It's just people should just work hard and they'll become millionaires. Um, okay. Let me stop there. Maybe take a question or two. So there's a few questions. Uh, one goes back to the question of his incentives. So if, if financial incentives are of so little importance, then are there other types of incentives which could matter, or do incentives play no role at all? Another Sorry, one. Sorry, yeah, say that again. Sure. It asks, um, according to Gregory Mankiw, people respond to incentives. But if financial incentives, as we talked about before, ha have little importance, then which incentives could matter? Or do they actually play no role at all in people's behavior? And then another question asks about the role of behavioral economics to improve take up of social policies, so whether nudges could help. And lastly, there's one question which asks, about, um, which starts with, there are many reports claiming that people are not happy with their job as well. So if jobs provide both meaning as well as a source of unhappiness, how can we resolve this dilemma? So, let me start with the third one, which is, I, I don't think there is a conflict between the idea that jobs provide meaning and that they make us often unhappy. I think those are, different dimensions. I think lots of things that we do um, which give us, uh, uh, you know, to take uh, an example from uh, which is often cited, uh, children are both, a, you know, a source of meaning in people's life, but they're often also a source of stress. Those are, those are different dimensions. I don't think they are the same, same thing. Often things that you care about most are also the most important source of unhappiness. Unhappiness is not the same thing as meaning. Happiness is not the same thing as meaning. I think that's uh, um, the, the, f and the, the first question was, sorry, say repeat. Uh, yeah, so, I think the answer is uh, people, I think again going back to meaning, meaning, that's why I wanted to actually start with that. Meaning is often important as an incentive. People often do things because it makes their life interesting, makes their life meaningful. And the, and the connection between that and being paid, so one of the, I, I don't know, among the people who um, who are, uh, you know, who are particularly uh, afflicted by the loss of meaning in the U.S. The people who are, where the, you see the death of despair. I don't know how much of that is loss of mm, loss of meaning from their job. How much of that is also loss of meaning from the fact that once you lose your job, you you lose your ability to you know get up in the morning and go to work and you maybe you start abusing drugs or something then you lose your job as the coach of the uh, soccer team and that's maybe a very important part of what you lose your your the respect of the community is what you lose so and 
that ties us back to the second question on behavioral. So I think one of the issues that uh, that I think uh, uh, this brings up is this question of um, how do we, in a context where uh, people people have a particular vision of themselves and that's uh, part of the reason they don't want to participate in welfare so they they want to, don't want to be the welfare receiving person how i think the central challenge of behavioral economics in a sense is how to, how do we if we i think the the starting point of traditional economics has been people's preferences are a given. We, we talked about this a while ago. Uh, people's preferences are something that they are endowed with and there is nothing um, more fundamental about that. If you think that meaning is something that actually makes people behave in very different ways when they find meaning, then in some sense we are starting by dis disposing of that fundamental premise. We are saying you know, people's lives are shaped by all kinds of things that are available to them and then they start to value those things. And if, if what they value is based on, you know, how their life is, how you give people life shape, then in some sense that's in some uh, this, they're at the heart of the behavioral economics uh, project, which is if I believe what kinds of things and, and therefore I want to just go back to, I think nudges are going to be important in getting people to take up programs. I think reminders are important, saying, you know, taking people to the, to sign up does help. There is evidence in the US that if you actually bring people the forms to fill in, they will do it more. Having said that, none of that gets us very high numbers. I think the, the real issue is we may want to go beyond nudges. We may, behavioral economics may be more important than just nudges. It might be that it's important to, uh, to connect what well-being means to people uh, in a more fundamental way to the question of, uh, of, uh, of uh, you know, behavior, you know, how does one then think about welfare and behavior uh, in some much deeper, in some much deeper sense of of, uh, of uh, behavioral rethinking of economics. I'll, I'll stop there and continue a little bit. One more? Okay, good. Okay, um, so you can see partly what the problem is. The problem is that you people seem to think that we live in a world where mobility is easy, incentive effects are strong, there's a whole tradition of, of looking down on the un undeserving poor. Here is an interesting experiment um, uh, by the late lamented Alberto Lazina, Stefani Stancheva, and uh, Edward Tesso. And it's an experiment that gives people, tells people about what we just learned, which is that there's less mobility in the US than you, you think. You tell that, what's striking is that, you know, the left wing people become more pro redistribution, because the, but the right wing people become more anti redistribution, or at least they don't move uh, in the obvious direction. They don't think that. And, and when you think about it, you might say that, look, you know, these are often people who already think there is lots of redistribution, too much. So if, if you think that there's enough redistribution, then it's not surprising that you actually move in the opposite direction. You think, okay, the government is trying its best, but in fact there's very little mobility. So therefore the government can't do anything. It's, it's powerless to affect this. People are whatever, doomed to be or they are you know, I think there's a racist element in many of these narratives, which is that, you know, these, these kinds of people, they're hopeless. They'll, even if you give them a chance, they won't be able to take it. And therefore, let's not bother. So I think there's a lot of this is just, you can read the same evidence as saying, either let's do more, 
or let's do less because it's not working. Uh, and I think, I'll, I think my sense of why we find this is because people actually uh, adjust their, their beliefs about, you know, about how, if left-wing people start with the belief that the government isn't doing enough, and so it's okay, they think they should, the government should do more. Right-wing people start with the idea that government is doing a lot, too much maybe. And so now that you observe that the government isn't succeeding, you just say that, okay, it's doing too much and it's not succeeding, why bother? And I think as I was alluding to, I think there is a clear sense in which one, one source of of uh, opposition, at least in the US, but also elsewhere, to welfare policies. Um, I think, for example, in India, there's uh, the ca caste is an extremely important driver of, of, well, of opposition to welfare policy, is, um, is ethnic biases. So white people in the US are more opposed to welfare than anyone else by a lot. This is true after controlling for education, income content, Quantiles and even political bias. So even take a, a, a conservative, a liberal, a conservative white and a conservative non-white. The whites are more anti anti welfare. So this is a study, uh, a survey experiment, MTurk, uh, which what it does is it it does it takes the same data and just reframes it to make it look, look, look different. And then it shows to, it's on MTurk, meaning it's on, online, and it's a survey experiment, so it's not particularly, it's not people are just asked questions, there's not a, the, the behavioral response is not, they're not doing something that's um, costly for them, they're just making choices, so th that's the caveat. Um, so th the experiment is to show people either the, the panel on the left or the panel on the right? The panel on the left, they're the same panel. They're just a little windows of, of, uh, of uh, data uh, cut from, one is cut from, the, uh, from the, the left, one on the left is cut from the one on the right, and, and you can see that on the one on the left shows that you know, there is not much of a trend. The one on the right shows that once you look on the longer term, there's a much bigger trend. There is the whites are becoming a minority in the US. So those are the same data, which, uh, but, but they're packaged in different ways. So people actually think these are different numbers. Um, if you show that the people, the, the one on the right, they are much more likely to become anti-welfare. Um, so this is, 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 is a, so they were asked, um, the question they were asked is, is, suppose the government has to cut its budget by 500 million dollars, uh, how much of that should come by, come out of cuts in welfare? And the answer is, if you, if you shown the graph on the right, you cut welfare, the, 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 you increase the amount of the cut in welfare by 40%. So very big effects on welfare. You, you basically say that, look, you know, if whites are just vanishing, that means we are being too nice to the non-whites and we just have to stop that. Or we, um, and you know, and they are more likely to also say, the same people are asked, do you care about your racial identity? And they say yes. When you show them one on the right, on the one on the left, they are much less likely to say that, you know, I don't, uh, I, uh, to say that I don't care about my racial identity. So, you could, the, the possible, I mean, so, you could imagine this is, their interpretation of this is that this is a result of, of people feeling paranoid that the, their country is being overrun by these other people and we are being too nice to them. Maybe cutting welfare will be, uh, will help them. You could also imagine a slightly different explanation which is that um, they, they, they think that for example the, you know, the mm, 
sort of more demographic explanation. This, the, the support for children is uh, too generous and welfare and therefore people, non-white people who are having more children, but it's some, it seems to be a, a reasonable uh, uh, so indicator that race has something to do with this story. Then they do another, another uh, experiment which is less obvious that they, uh, they should be doing, to be honest. The experiment, and this is an interesting debate between economists who don't like these experiments and others. So they lie. So they tell people either incomes are converging or diverging. In fact, incomes are not converging between blacks and whites, but they show claim fake fake pictures showing that they're converging and, or, or real pictures showing that they're diverging. So they show show that and ni neither neither has mm, Um, much of an effect. You can also show people that minorities benefit more from welfare. People probably already think that, so that also doesn't have an effect. But if you combine the two, you do have an effect. So people, when, when you're told that, you know, the minorities benefit from welfare and they're catching up, which is sort of a story we were suggesting, then we do find a correlation. So now, there is a, what is strange is that you find the same effect among the minorities. So when you show that to the minorities, they also seem to be anti-welfare. So it's not clear exactly how that's being interpreted, but I, that's the most clear. Now, this evidence echoes an interesting piece of US history. So in the US, um, between uh, around the First World War, after the First World War into the 1920s, there is a, a major sh set of major shifts in immigration. Uh, the reason is that first, of course, during the First World War, Germans are not allowed to come to the US. And Germans are a huge part of the US population. The single largest ethnicity in the US is German. So, or at least white, single largest white ethnicity in the US is German. So Germans were uh, blocked. Then a lot of Italians came, Ital Italy was on, the US side of the war. Uh, a lot of Italians came. When the Italians came, there was a pushback. People didn't like all those Italians coming. So after 1921, a law was passed to actually encourage the Germans to come relative to the Italians. Qu there were quotas were imposed on the Italians too. So as a result, there were major shifts in the geographical patterns of migration because people who migrate always go to where previous migrants from their own country came. So Italians went to Boston, uh, Germans went to the Midwest. So Boston got a lot more immigrants during the period where the Italians were coming during the First World War period, and that stopped after 1921. Uh, it, uh, the Germans, the places got, which had German, um, you know, a lo lot of Germans had already settled, got more Germans after 1921. So the, there were different places where at different points of time, the number of new migrants were, went up and down. So you can compare places where, because they had originally a lot of Italian migrants, they got a big inflow right during the war, but with places that didn't get a big inflow because they had mostly German migrants. And you can see what happens to, to uh, to the labor market outcomes. Good news: five percent increase in immigration actually increases the employment of the natives by one point six percent. The natives upgrade their jobs; they start becoming employers and supervisors of the new migrants. So, in fact, everybody benefits from this, but. The political reaction was uh, negative. Um, Democrats lost support in cities with more immigrants, where the more immigrant flows. Pu public spending goes down, taxes are cut. There's a famous example of where um, 
you know, this that's from a different period when this again happens in the 1950s when the city, 60s, cities are racially integrated. There used to be pools, swimming pools. When the swimming pools were integrated, there was support to pour concrete in the pools to fill them up so that you don't have to swim with the, swim with the black people. <coughs> so um, in particular places, things where new immigrants worked, like for example in garbage collection, those were things where funding went down. So there was a clear shift in the places which happened to get more immigrants they, they started taking policies with the anti-immigrant, even though immigrants were good for the natives. Um, and the claim was that these immigrants are all useless, they're really just, you know, here to steal public money. Uh, in fact, it was not true. Immigrants typically use less public money. They're younger and more, more, uh, more um, selected to work hard. So there's no evidence for that. Um, so uh, this is so. I, I, I'm almost out of time, so let me um, take one more set of questions, and then okay, no, no more questions. So I'll, I'll I'll continue, and then maybe take questions at the end. Um, so. At this point, we sort of see that there's a whole set of cultural and maybe uh, historical reasons. People have beliefs in mobility that were once upon a time maybe true. America was very mobile in the 19th century and is no longer true. So a lot of Americans believe in a myth of America that no longer exists, but that then makes them anti welfare so there so that's a so there are good reasons and bad reasons why people are but mostly bad reasons i guess why people are anti welfare good meaning there are reasons that are at least mm, so may, i mean they, they consistent with their beliefs um if you really believe that welfare isn't useful then opposing it makes sense and if you see lack of mobility maybe you believe that just confirms your belief that mobility is you the government can't do anything with all that we do see a shift uh, right now there is support um, for wealth taxes much more than than historically in the US right now and Biden seems to be acting on it there seems to be a a real uh, moment where people are willing to absorb some redistribution. So it's a good context to reimagine re social policy. So maybe it's the case that despite these structural constraints, maybe this COVID, COVID convinced people that maybe some more government intervention is useful. I don't know how long it would last. Okay, so just to summarize what we have learned, uh, we don't really know how to foster growth. It's not clear that we need more growth. Um, growth goes mostly to the rich, at least in in UK and the US, but more and more in more and more countries. And in the rich countries, in the poorer countries, we definitely need growth. Uh, and most inequality is regional. There's very clustered. There are places which are going down in the north of the UK. That's, uh, you, that's the reason why you see this support for Brexit, which they see as being responsible for the decline of the north of the UK, of, of England. The north of England is uh, supported uh, Brexit, even though they're t traditionally left-wing and poor. And they supported Brexit because uh, they see that this, they think that this is, uh, their regions are being decimated by trade. So openness is somehow being blamed. So we see exactly this pattern in many countries. Mm. People are slow to move and uh, partly for sort of socio-cultural reasons, they like being with their friends, partly because the, because the few places where this economic success tend to be very, very, uh, there's very small number of them, 
They're very clustered, they're very expensive. Real estate is extremely expensive in California, it's extremely expensive in New York, it's extremely expensive in Boston. These are the places where there's success. Uh, failure is much more widely distributed and so uh, they are coming from places where real estate is extremely cheap because, cheap because people are leaving and going to places where few places which are very uh, the hubs of growth where real estate is extremely expensive and that's not easy to do. Um, I think in this context it's clearly very important to think about how to, how to redistribute better. It's both a uh, moral, and, uh, poli moral and imperative and a political necessity and I think that uh, we are, I think if we don't do it we will certainly take the risk that everything that sort of makes our society pleasant will be lost along in that rage, in the fire that, oh, that will come um, next time. Um, and this is all, uh, all the more because our automation is coming and it's going to destroy uh, jobs at least temporarily. Expanding redistribution is not easy. L I think low-income low voters are often skeptical and particularly because they associate their uh, wealth, the, the, the redistribution with groups that they don't look down upon, they now don't want to benefit from it because they think that by benefiting from welfare they'll be associated with these groups that they look down upon. So in, even for their own selves, they don't want it. So I think that how do we normalize, uh, redesign social support in this context? Well, first, I think normalize job loss. I think the key idea that I think uh, especially uh, I think Denmark, the flex security idea in Denmark has pioneered is the idea that job loss is not your fault. It's a normal characteristic of a modern capitalist economy. You lose jobs. It's normal. It's not your fault. You lose jobs. Some you'll find another one. It's society's obligation to find you a job. I think changing the relationship between unemployment and failure is critical. Protect regional, regional economies. So as we said, people don't move very much. It's hard to move. Real estate prices discourage movement. Uh, it's also hard to move uh, just physically because for example um, uh, you know you you have your mother is the, in uh, she she lives in the same town as you you can have get free childcare from her how do you if you move somewhere else how do you get childcare so i think i think there's a bunch of reasons why regional economies are difficult to sort of people stick there so I think protected some to some extent protecting them is useful. The European farm sub subsidies in a sense are a good example of keeping the countryside from becoming blighted which which uh, we enjoy when we travel in Europe. Um, I think probably helping people move is the other side of that people should I think making sure that they can for example providing easier access to childcare. US has essentially no subsidized childcare. Providing easier access to childcare would make it easier to move. Uh, providing uh, you know, easier, some temporary uh, subsidy to, for moving, for you know, transitioning to a new river, you know, piece of real estate, those, those would all help. Um, I think probably I think all of that needs to co be combined with, and this is where I think the real divergence with U UBI comes, with I think a, a very critical investment in creating new meaningful jobs. And we know roughly where those jobs need to be. They need to be in, in uh, elderly care, in, in child care, in, in uh, Healthcare, all of these areas, we, we know that there is de demand for more services and place 
in where automation is not going to help us. So I think we know roughly where, where those jobs need to, need to be created. And we know also that those actually, especially uh, better quality, for example, Head Start programs, the high quality Head Start programs have massive long-term benefits. The children from low-income backgrounds who get them actually have much better life. Uh, so I think that we know that intervening in the, is socially worthwhile and it creates meaningful jobs. So I think that that's a, that's a key uh, step. And finally, employment programs should be designed to, to not to tell people that, look, you know, now that you lost your job and you don't have any skills, what do I do to you? But to, to encourage people to value themselves. And in some sense, that's a, that's a program that uh, is the, there are NGOs that are doing that. Um, the Travailler et Apprendre Ensemble, Work and Learn Together program in France is one example of that, where they work with people who have lost their livelihoods, who have lost their, even their basic self-respect, in many cases who have, who, are, who have lost their homes, who lost their, uh, you know, lost their children because they were abusing drugs, and takes them and gives them a, a way to rebuild their lives. And I think that's critical to think about how, what they are doing there, because they're, not only of investing in, in you know, the job itself, but in the person. And I think that's a, it's a critical way of re thinking about it. Um, job replacement programs, likewise, are l there are examples again in France. The Senat program is well known for not in, starting by not telling people, OK, now you go do this because you lost your job or you didn't get that job. Um, but to actually listen to them and give them, again, work on their confidence. And the, the slogan um, from, uh, you know, Ate de Catrium Monde, which is another French NGO, all together in dignity to overcome poverty. I think that's, that, that, I think, should be our charge as as economists, as human beings, as participants in society. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Uh, quick in questions. Yeah. Uh, so one question is, in evaluating the empirical evidence of welfare policies, how does one measure dignity? And another is, uh, what would be the effect of open borders on inequality and the economy as a whole? So on, on the uh, question of how one measures dignity, I think that's hard. I think it's, I, I mean, I, I think we know lots of markers of it. Do people, does it stress them out to do certain types of, uh, we put in some certain types of positions. Do we know measure ways to measure stress? We kind of know how to measure at least self-reported well-being. Dignity, I don't think we, we have got there. We'll need to, so I, I, I take that as a challenge. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, I'm just terrible today. What's the other question? Open borders. Open borders, I mean, I, as you might remember from Esther's lecture, probably would, I mean, you get some more people, but is it going to be huge? Probably not. People are very slow to move, so it will probably be some more people and uh, some more poorer people. Um, so global inequality will go down a little. Within rich country inequality might go up a little, but uh, it first order, I don't think is a huge uh, part of the story. 